Okay, let's do a close reading now of this of this poem uh, and see if we can figure out what the basic story is. Um, let's start with that title, Ozymandias. I think just when I hear that um, word, I feel it suggests already something mysterious. It suggests the East or the Middle East um, with all the accompanying luxury and exotic uh, feeling that is accompanied with that. I think uh, also there's... I can't tell anymore because I read it so much, but I feel like there's something tyrannical. I can't tell if that's what I hear or if that's what I know from reading, but I do feel that that's something um, in that name from the start. I met a traveler from the antique land, not an old land, antique, um, old, aged, valued. Um, who said, so here we have the first layer of the poem. Um, the speaker of the poem tells us that he met someone. And this person he met told him of something else. Uh, and we get a, a really vivid description of what he saw on his journey. And he saw two vast and trunkless legs of stone trunkless so basically a very hu a huge but not just huge vast is is i think part, for me part of the mystery and amazement of this poem are these words like antique and vast which suggest so much um and and be, and and push the meaning of the poem much further but also there's a very simple thing being described here as well. There's a trunkless, meaning there's no torso on these two legs of stone uh, in the desert uh, that this that this um, this person found. These huge legs, vast legs uh, of stone, but no no actual torso. But near them um, was uh, a shattered visage, a, sh a, a destroyed face, presumably the top of the statue. Um, and what does he notice about this face? Frown, wrinkled lip, sneer. Um, we should write those. What does Ozymandias look like? He frowns, he, his lip is wrinkled, and he sneers. And the speaker imagines his sneer is of cold command. Orders, but all these things show a kind of authority. I'm going to say aggression. But already, you see, we're playing the game of when something's described, it is the describer that's revealing so much of themselves. I mean, it's very hard for me to say what this statue looked like because I'm getting it from someone else who told the speaker of the poem. And I think that effect, if you think about that effect, it's very important for, for the idea of interpretation or transmission. Um, what do we actually know about this sculpture? Did it actually exist? It doesn't really matter. It's how this traveler created the story of this statue. Um, what the person thought that these details revealed was that the sculptor, well those passions read, which yet survive. The, the sculptor, the artist, carefully observed Ozymandias and were able to, when the man doesn't survive, <coughs> these aspects of him definitely do. And on lifeless things, we're able to stamp these passions. So on stone, which is lifeless, the sculptor was able to print life. 
I think when I wrote print, it makes me immediately think of the poem. Again, we get this classic, classic theme in literature about how art survives, but people die. Um, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. I mean, here now we get to see more of this person's version of this statue. This was a mockery that the sculptor was able to say. And the heart that fed. How was he a heart that fed? I don't know. That part seems strange to me. I still don't know about that. That I have, for sure. He was mocking. But the heart that fed remains strange to me. Um, now, at the base of these two legs, there was a pedestal, and on it appear these very famous lines. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. So Ozymandias wasn't just a king, but he was king of kings. He was the top. And he had a world uh, of luxury and power, and, his, and these he referred to as his works. And he invites the reader, the visitor, from hundreds of years later to come and look at what he's done, look at my, on my works. And he addresses not the weak, but the mighty. He's not talking to the slaves, he's talking to other great kings, uh, people who've achieved, and he says, come here, look at my things and despair and be full of sadness at what you aren't. I think, again, this is another, I mean, if you think about music, specifically rap music, the boasting of art. Within this poem, um, the despair that life ends but art lasts, but within this poem there's another theme, which is this idea of boasting, of, uh, 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 of claiming that you've done something amazing. But the sad, sad reality is that what Ozymandias thinks will last forever is just two legs, two trunkless legs now. Uh, his face is shattered. The, the place is a complete wreck because, as the person notes, the traveler, nothing beside remains. And what is left, actually, of these works, decay, a colossal wreck, a huge and enormous wreck, not a small wreck, but a colossal one, as, as big and monstrous and gigantic as this achievement was, now it is in equally that large a wreck. And this place is boundless and bare. So the walls that once held perhaps a castle in a community are now gone. So this, this vastness, this emptiness is infinite. It continues on and on. And it's bare. There's, there's actually no clothing. There's nothing there anymore. Um, and Shelley continues to paint this image of emptiness. Lone and level sands. I mean, why this image? Lone augments or continues this uh, idea of bare. But level sands are that phenomenon in the desert where the desert flattens everything. Uh, you know, the sand consumes everything, and the wind makes that levelness, that equality uh, that comes with death, decay, hiddenness. Uh, time has passed over, I think. The idea that sand, I mean, here again, oh, all of a sudden I thought of an hourglass. You know, time has passed and has made everything level, equal, equally dead. Um, there's no, there's nothing special about Ozymandias anymore. Um, and these sands stretch far away. There's a, there's a bleakness. There's a, there's a bleak emptiness to the end of this poem. And what I wonder is, is this a poem? The obvious reading is this juxtaposition right here between Ozymandias' claims of being mighty and nothing lasting. Is this, is this poem making fun of Ozymandias? Is this poem, on the other hand, taking the side of the sculptor, the artist, and saying that art has a way of preventing this deterioration? Look at us. 200 years later, we're still looking at this poem. And actually, this is not fragmented. This is a very finely made poem. Um, 
Or is there just something just terribly empty and pointless about everything that ends the poem, that ultimately we'll all die and we will all be covered by the level sands, and that ultimately there's a complete emptiness and a boundless, bare, naked loneliness that is death. Uh, I think that the poem, the poem doesn't decide that, but it, it keeps those different readings alive. And I think multiple readings of it, especially as you attend to the real craft um, of these, of this simple construction, this, um, which again happens to be a sonnet, so is participating in those classic themes, which has um, rhyme and has uh, a great deal of the technical uh, necessities of poetry, but uh, are really secondary to me, to the image and feeling I get from reading this poem over and over again. What the poem means, I think that's something you need to decide, but that those decisions need to start with your heart and your mind and, and your ear, but it need to be grounded specifically in the language uh, of the poem and what you can explain and interpret.